important point. Now, could you call fire cracked china from the five and dime and red handled knives and forks and spoons that were bent and coming apart? Could you really call those things furniture? Yes, she said firmly. I want to look at the apartment. I a good flashlight, he said, and went back into his apartment, closing the door behind him so that it made a soft, sucking sound. He said something, but he couldn't hear what it was. The whispering voice inside the apartment stopped, and the dog was suddenly quiet. Then he was back at the door, closing it behind him so it made the same soft, sucking sound. He had a long, black flashlight in his hand, and she went up the stairs ahead of him, thinking that the rod of its length was almost as black as his hands. The flashlight was a shiny black, smooth and gleaming faintly as the light lay along its length, whereas the hand that held it was flesh, dull, scarred, worn flesh, no smoothness in it. The knuckles were knobs that stood out under the skin, pulled out from hauling ashes, shoveling coal. But not apparently from using a mop or a broom, for as she went up and up the steep flight of stairs, she saw that they were filthy with waste paper, cigarette butts, the discarded wrappings from packages of snuff, pink ticket stuff from the movie houses. On the landings, there were empty gin and whiskey bottles. She stopped looking at the stairs, stopped peering into the corner of the long hallways, for it was cold, and she began walking faster, trying to keep warm. As they completed the flight of stairs and turned to walk up and down, and then started climbing another flight of stairs, she was aware that the cold increased. The farther up they went, the colder it got. And in summer, she supposed it would get hotter and hotter as we went up, until when you reached the top floor, your breath would be cut off completely. The halls were so narrow that she could reach out and touch them on either side without having to stretch her arms any distance. When they reached the fourth floor, she thought, instead of her reaching out to the walls, the walls were reaching out for her, bending and swaying toward her in an effort to envelop her. The super's footsteps behind her were slow, even, steady. She walked a little faster, and apparently, without hurrying, without even increasing his pace, he was exactly the same distance behind her. In fact, his heavy footsteps were a little nearer than before. She began to wonder how it was that she had gone up the stairs first. Why was she leading the way? It was all wrong. He was the one who knew the place, the one who lived here. He should have gone up first. How had he got her to go up the stairs in front of him? She wanted to turn around and see the expression on his face. She knew that she had been scared by the her face would be on the level with her. She didn't need to turn around anyone. Anyway. She was staring at her back, her legs, her back. She could feel those eyes traveling over her, estimating her, summing her up, wondering about her. As she climbed up the last flight of stairs, she was aware that the skin on her back was crawling with fear. Fear of what? She asked herself. Fear of him? Fear of the dark? Of the smells in the halls, the high, steep stairs, of yourself? She didn't know. And even as she admitted that she didn't know, she felt sweat start pouring from her armpits, dampening her forehead, breaking out in beads on her nose. The apartment was in the back of the house. The super fished another flashlight from his pocket, which he handed to her before he bent over to unlock the door very quietly. And she thought, everything he does... He does quietly. She played the beam of the flashlight on the walls. The rooms were small. There was no window in the bedroom. At least she supposed it was the bedroom. She walked over to look at it, and then went inside for a better look. There wasn't a window, just an air shaft, and a mirror one at that. She looked around the room, thinking that by the time there was a bed and a chest of drawers in it, there'd barely be space enough to walk around in and that she'd probably bump her knees every time she went past the corner of the bed. She tried to visualize how the room would look and began to wonder why she had already decided to take this room for herself 
It might be better to give it to Bug. Let him have a real bedroom to himself for once. No, that wouldn't be. He would swelter in his room in summer. It would be better to have him sleep on the couch in the living room. At least he'd get some air. But there was a window out there. Though it wasn't a very big one. She looked out into the living room, trying again to see the window, to see just how much air would come through. How much light there would be for Bob to study by when he came home from school. To determine, too, the amount of air that would reach into the room at night when the window was open and he was sleeping curled up on a studio couch. The super was standing in the middle of the living room, waiting for her. It wasn't anything that she had to wonder about or figure out. It wasn't by any stretch of the imagination something she had conjured up out of thin air. It was a simple fact. He was waiting for her. She knew it just as she knew she was standing there in that small room. He was holding his flashlight, so the beam fell down at his feet. It turned him into a figure of never-ending tallness, and his silent waiting when his appearance of incredible height appalled her. With the light of his feet like that, he looked as though his head must end somewhere in the ceiling. He simply went up and up into darkness, and he radiated such desire for her that she could feel it. She told herself she was a fool, an idiot, drunk on fear, on fatigue and gnawing worry. Even while she thought it, the hot, choking awfulness of his desire for her pinned her there, so that she couldn't move. It was an aching yearning that filled the apartment, pushed against the walls, plucked at her arms. She forced herself to start walking toward the kitchen. As she went past him, it seemed to her that he actually did reach one long arm out toward her his body swaying so that its exaggerated length almost brushed against her. She really couldn't be certain of it, she decided, and resolutely turned the beam of her flashlight on the kitchen walls. It isn't impossible to read people's minds, she argued. Now the super was probably not even thinking about her when he was standing there like that. He probably wanted to get back downstairs to read his paper. Don't kid yourself, she thought. He probably can't read. Or if he can, he probably doesn't spend any time at it. Well, listen to the radio. That was it. He probably wanted to hear his favorite program, and she had thought he was filled with the desire to leap upon her. She was as bad as Granny. Which just went on to prove you couldn't be brought up by someone like Granny without absorbing a lot of nonsense that would spring at you out of nowhere, so to speak, and when you least expected it. All those tales about things that people sensed before they actually happened. Tales that have been handed down and down and down until if you try to trace them back, you'd end up God knows where, probably Africa. And Granny had them all at the tip of her tongue. Yet with wanting to hear a radio program make a mate, she presumed because there was no window that the vent pipe would serve as a source of nice, fresh, clean air. One thing about it, the rent wouldn't be very much. It couldn't be for a place like this. Tiny hall, bathroom on the right, kitchen straight ahead, living room to the left of the hall, and you had to go through the living room to get to the bedroom. The whole apartment would fit very neatly into just one good-sized room. She was conscious that all the little rooms smelt exactly alike. It was a mixture that contained the faint, persistent odor of gas, of old walls, dusty plaster, and over it all the heavy, sour smell of garbage, a smell that seeped through the dumb waiter shop. She started humming under her breath, not realizing she was doing it. It was an old song that Granny used to sing. Ain't no resting place for a sinner like me, like me, like me. It had a nice recurrent rhythm. Like me, like me. The humming increased in volume as she stood there thinking about the apartment. There was a clear muffled sound from the super in the living room. The start of her soul, she nearly dropped her flashlight. What was that? She said sharply, thinking, my God, suppose I dropped it. Suppose I'd been left standing there in the dark of this little room, and he turned out his light. Suppose he'd start walking toward me, nearer and nearer in the dark. 
and I could only hear his footsteps. Couldn't see him, but could hear him coming closer until I started reaching out in the dark, trying to keep him away from me, trying to keep him from touching me. And then, then my hands found him right in front of me. At the thought, she gripped the flashlight so tightly that the long beam of light from it started wavering and dancing over the walls so that the shadows moved. Shadow from the light pushed her overhead, shadow from the door, shadow from the very door of its head, quickly moving back and forth. That's me in my throat, the speaker said. His voice had a choked, unnatural sound as though something had gone wrong with his breathing. She walked out into the hall, not looking at him, opened the door of the apartment, and stepping over the threshold, still not looking at him, said, I finished looking. How many of you thought it was boring? It was boring. How many of you fell asleep? How many of you couldn't pay attention? Uh, first thing you know, yeah. Good. Remember? So remember in the beginning of the semester?